Namaste viewers, welcome to Jaipur Dala USA. And today we are going to dive into a serious issue of uh, what, is, what are India's geopolitical challenges. Uh, so, you know, to discuss this matter with specific reference to United States, China, and our neighbors. I have the greatest of privileges of welcoming two very prominent strategic thinkers and uh, one is Brigadier Dr. Arun Sogalji from Delhi and Dr. Adityanji, who is here in the United States. So both of you, welcome to the program. Uh, one of your mics is making noise, as you can make out. So just check that thing at your end. That's is my good. mic okay? Yes, you are fine. Is my mic okay? Yes, now it is. Okay, now it is. All right, so let's get going. One of the things which is critical for us, I mean, I live in the United States, we have continuously been facing the narrative of India-US relationship, which has been through many world plays, strategic partners, democracy, oldest democracy, uh, largest democracy, you know, strategic need, global imperatives. It, there are many ways in which the India-US relationship has been. Where do you see this going forward under Biden administration, beset it that it is with a very critical issue called climate change? So before you shoot out, Arunji, I will ask, request you to do that. Request to all the viewers, please like, subscribe, and support our channel. Uh, in Jaipur Dialogue, India is a big unit. We have over 700,000 subscribers there. US, we have started this to build that same narrative. So I urge all of you to subscribe, like, and support. Ask your questions to prominent uh, you know, speakers today. Arunji, please go ahead. Because you are in the field, you have been in the military, and the United States, China, India, they are playing a, an amazing role. So your opening statement on that. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Rizuti. Uh, for this opportunity, I'm simply honored. And uh, let me take a couple of minutes to share some of my thoughts. Uh, I'll cover my uh, remarks. There is some little background noise coming. I can't hear you now. I think he is muted. Okay. Okay. So if I can continue. Uh, uh, Yes, the, the I will I will try to look at the global developments in the form of emergence of two global orders. I mean, two blocks in the in in our global system. The second issue that I'll talk about is the nature of contestation, and the third element of that will be the implications for India. Fundamentally, we are seeing an emergence of U.S.-led Western-oriented block, which has in itself two elements. One is the NATO context in Europe and the Indo-Pacific construct in the Indo-Pacific, in which uh, there is the, the issue of uh, uh, quadrilateral, but more importantly, in terms of, 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 of military orientation or strategic orientation, is the block of uh, United States, Japan, Australia, and adding to that is South Korea and the whole element of AUKUS that is with me. The whole issue centers around one single aspect, and that is the need of the United States, which does not accept the concept of multipolarity. They, I, I would like you to recall the famous remarks of Obama, President Obama, where he said there is no second place for America in the global order. So the basic point is that the Americans are trying to ch change. And why not? Because they, they have been a unipolar power all along. To change the global system to the norms set by them in the post-Westphalian order, 
and followed them right through uh, till the 1991 and beyond. It is only recently, with the rise of the China, and 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 its own internal disconcertations, that the United States is seeing a relative decline. The American power is coming into increasingly into question. So, the when we look at the U.S.-led international order, we are looking at an attempt to consolidate both the European angle against the rise of Eurasia or expansion of Eurasia and the Indo-Pacific order where the United States want to re-leverage its power and influence against an assertive China. Countering this is what I call an Eurasian order. The Eurasian order is a is a construct of Russo-China in Tant, which is, which is essentially a bloc with two major powers on the continental powers, that is Russia and China, which are coming together to challenge United States led Western oriented global system and carve out its own space. The important point to note is that even in the Eurasian order, there are multiple mini laterals or mini orders which are uh, operating. One of them is the Central Asia, FPAC, China, Russia, or what we can call a center around the SEO. And then the second is the Middle Eastern order, which is centered around Iran, Iraq, Russia, uh, among others. So, what we are seeing is that there are intrinsic tensions building up on this. The fact of the matter is that these tensions are causing disruptions in the global system. And these disruptions will have economic, strategic, as well as very severe trade-oriented uh, implications and which is impacting what when we, when we can say is the global south or those countries which are which are remaining on the margins of these two who do not want to be part of any of these two blocks but are on the margins of these two and yet strong enough to to follow a, a unilateral path so what are the implications for india India is following essentially what I call a balancing strategy. Our interest in Quad is driven by economic, trade, technological, and social aspects, which is basically dealing with what I call uh, soft security challenges. And it is important to look at them from a perspective of creating a reasonable strategic balance, both economic, political, and even if I were to use uh, military balance in Indo-Pacific against the rising assertions, assertions of China. As far as uh, looking, as far as Indo-US relationships are concerned, there are two aspects I'd like to flag. Fundamentally, if we look at the construct of the quadrilateral and the way India is, is being uh, signing up to a large number of initiatives being uh, post the last meeting of the quadrilateral, that is the economic forum, the uh, the ISR, the maritime initiative, the uh, other economic uh, uh, initiatives, the uh, the infrastructure initiative. The whole again the idea is to be a part and player and economic partner in in. Uh, in economic and social development of the region that India is located in. But the problem is basically is this, is that this brings me to, sorry, not the problem, this brings me to the issue of the perceptions of India's China policy vis-a-vis -vis the United States. And this is something which I want to highlight and flag. 
we are on the same page with the united states as long as as in terms of understanding the challenge being posed by china but our dealing of the challenge is not the same we are looking at what we call a constraining strategy which is built up on two major initiatives fundamental initiative is that we will not allow the chinese to take a military advantage of us develop military capacities and capabilities in terms of building military capacity and capabilities we are looking at seeking internal balancing from our friends and partners of whom the first foremost partner is united states the second challenge is is we will continue to balance this military orientation with a strategy of engagement and that an economic engagement and that is why you see that we have a nearly 120 120 billion dollar trade with china so there is this whole element that india wants to push china up to a point india does not want to get into a conflict with china and yet be military prepared to dealing with should such a conflict come about that is the fundamentals of our of our thinking but where are the united states is concerned and that's where the gap occurs is united states is looking at constraining containing and maybe eventually a conflict oriented strategy maybe over a question of taiwan so if you are looking at constraining conflict and uh, containing and conflict strategy the india's india will have problems in supporting united states particularly if it comes to taiwan india will sympathize empathize with this thing but i am not too sure how far will india go in in supporting a conflict over taiwan with the united states and china so therefore india is now trying to work this whole element of multiple challenges through a number of many laterals which i like to again flag recently we have had a, a meeting between india france and australia a mini lateral which is looking at the uh, indian ocean both the eastern flank and the western flank as you know the french have got a major presence in in western indian ocean and and uh, australians are a eastern indian ocean power and then we are also looking at uh, uh, another mini lateral uh, which is france india and uh, united states so the so the question basically is is that from india's perspective regional balance con- constraining chinese overly assertions is the mainstay of our strategy vis-a-vis this thing and in that india looks at united states as its most consequential partner now a word about russia i will come to russia, russia later okay okay, okay. i stop, stop here russia. then in which yeah. case i stop here yeah. sorry i have spoken too long no 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 this is perfect it is very important for people to understand the dynamics of the strategic geopolitical strategies and equations which is very because there are things to pull and pull around aritin ji you have a problem with the mic sir kyunki aapke awaaz se aapke mic se problem aa rahi hai all the noise that is coming is from you i had unmuted my mic and now i am available i don't know what problem is coming now you are okay aapke yahan se aawaz ki problem hai sir yeah can you hear me i can hear you but your sound is still coming from your side well i am not sure what is the problem here okay let's go to the question you know like uh, brigadier sagal pointed out lots of issues of which perhaps the most striking word was india's policy of being maintaining a strategic balance uh but as the international geopolitics goes about they say lot happens nothing changes so the dynamics of this is that nothing changes you keep playing the game again and again and again and again now the question is knowing what we know now we are living in a world today 
where the news travels faster than the speed of lightning, if I may use the sentence in that fashion. Okay? So when that happens, the key issue here is that uh, a lot of things are happening, but nothing changes. Where do we go from here? And this the reason what I'm saying is that economics plays the key role. Economics plays the key role. Both China and America are very large trading partners of India. Both over $100 billion worth of trade. The economic need of India is huge. Every country knows that India has 1.3 billion people in the big market. Are we, is India able to take full advantage of that leverage that is enjoys in the global economy, both in relation to China and United States? And therefore, it bothers me when I keep seeing that the China, Chinese policies of continuously in, making incursions and uh, irritating India with border disputes, is it to its advantage? That's something I want to hear from you. So first of all, let me thank you, Mr. Jha, for inviting me on this forum. I must say that I feel very humbled to be on this forum with Brigadier Dr. Arun Sagal, who is an undisputed military strategist and thinker who has spent you know, almost 40 years working in this field. So I do feel humbled. And he so eloquently you know, analyzed the situation that there's not much for me to say. <laughs> but I will make an attempt to answer your question. Uh, it is true that things are not changing. A lot is being done, but you see, history never ceases. History never comes to end, despite some silly predictions. And I think we are in very exciting time. And although there is a perceived bipolarity at this point in time, much to chagrin of United States, we are moving towards a multipolar world both economically as well as strategically. And if you look at the situation, India is being courted by pretty much all the blocks, declared blocks as well as undeclared blocks. And it is in India's advantage to be on the table in all these four, because in the past we had made a mistake of rejecting certain platforms. As far as the United States is concerned, United States strategy was to use China as a balancing power to break the Soviet Union. And by supporting China for 30, 40 years, consistently, initially unofficially, subsequently openly, they were able to achieve their goals. And in the early 1990s, Soviet Union broke down. What US is doing now, they want to use India as a balancing power to contain China. Now, India would like to contain China. India would like to balance China, but India is not going to be a camp follower of United States. India has its own issues, which Brigadier Sagal has al already elaborated, that India would push China to a certain extent, but not go into a hot war kind of situation. So yes, we gain a lot from our relationship with the United States economically, now strategically in the military sphere, because we are getting some weapons transfer from the United States. But India cannot be like UK. India cannot take dictates from the United States on every geopolitical challenge. Coming to economics, that is where the crunch lies for India. For India to rise 
and tackle all these challenges, India has to improve what Chinese call comprehensive national power, which is a metric that takes into consideration a number of variables. And as per Chinese calculation, they are on the top as far as comprehensive national power is concerned, followed by United States. India has to reform from within our economy, our social structure, our constitutional issues, so that we can face these challenges. Now, there has been a lot of talk about, you know, achieving 5 trillion economy. We are already a 3.5 trillion economy. We are number five, and we just displaced UK in terms of economy, in terms of GDP. I think rather than put an artificial uh, bar or cap, five trillion, I think we need to say that we need to grow in double digits. That should be our goal. It is possible if we can reform our obsolete laws only with economic prosperity they will be trickled down in other spheres and we would be able to you know deal with the strategic challenges also so yes it is good that india has been offered from both the sides india is a member of brics india is a member of sco but india is now a member of quad india is a member of ipef indo-pacific economic framework India is also part of the West Asian Quad or I2U2. And it is good from India's perspective that you are getting a seat on the table. There was a time, you know, India did not get seat on APEC, Asia Pacific, you know, economic cooperation. India is still struggling to get on NSG. India is still not on United Nations Security Council. But as the world order changes, you will have the hegemon and the rising hegemon trying to recreate the geopolitical architecture of the world. And in that process, we have to exert our influence on every platform. And we also need to start creating new platforms. So I'll give you an example. BRICS was started mainly at the initiative taken by China and Russia. It was from an acronym, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. What happened? The rising hegemon China enlarged the concept of BRICS and brought South Africa, although South Africa was nowhere in picture, nowhere in the league of these four economies. What China is doing now? China is trying to enlarge BRICS by inviting Iran and Argentina. So we need to create minilaterals, plurilaterals, where we have the dominant say. In 2013, I had given a suggestion that India should enlarge IPSA. IPSA is India, Brazil, and South Africa. And my suggestion was that probably we need to invite Indonesia as well as Argentina so that we exert our platform in middle level countries and try to change the dialogue. And I think that is where we have lacked that we are very diffident. We don't make, take the initiatives for some reason or the other, and we tend to become camp followers. Okay, we can join SEO, we can join BRICS, we can join I2U2. In fact, a year ago, I had sorted out a proposal. I had suggested that India should take lead in creating a new economic framework called IPCO, Indo-Pacific Cooperation Organization. And I wrote a couple of papers on that and they are available publicly. Within a year, United States suggested Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. There's no difference. So why could not India take that lead so sometimes we are very diffident, we are paralyzed with inaction. That is our main challenge. We need to develop a spine and we need to guard our own interests, whether they are in economic sphere, in mercantile issues, security issues, 
or strategic issues i mean i am happy to say that in the neighborhood india is a net aid provider in the subcontinent country we, we come to we'll come to neighborhood later <laughs> you have made some very very powerful statements can you mute your mic abidin okay yeah that sound went away it is coming from you only that all the disturbance is coming from your end the point which <laughs> uh, which aditya ji was talking about that why doesn't india take the lead and initiative in pushing through its own geopolitical strategy or agenda that's very important <clears throat> so for example i was going to ask both of you uh, a question about nato because nato is driving the world geopolitical military and uh, other affairs and i was thinking about it the other day and i realized thought about it tell me if i'm wrong both of you are very very prominent uh, geo strategic thinkers that nato is nothing else but a european army armed club of which united states also is a member and their charter is clause 5 or whatever that if anyone is attacked everybody is attacked there is no other institution like that military pact in the world apart from its economic unit uh, un- economic uh, elements of that nato agreement but mostly it is a military pact talking about what aditya ji said and i brought here why there is nothing like a pacific treaty organization pto <laughs> but there is a cord now there is an initiative happening on indo pacific so arun ji my request to you would be to talk about the issue raised by aditya ji where is the leadership how come india has despite its dominant strategic location population resources why is india hesitant to take those bold steps of defining the strategy itself like china is doing like america is doing each one is pursuing their own goal whether we like it or not america says very openly we are for exceptional country we will we will pursue our own life liberty and happiness we have not such, no such doctrine that's that's the issue to assert itself what must india do thank you uh, it's a very interesting question uh, let me give you just two word answer we are strategically conservative uh, we have failed till now to define a credible strategic vision uh, the elements within the governance system are not very clear where do they want to see india in 2030 2035 2040 what is it that uh, what is the indian dream okay there is a china dream there is everybody else has a dream everybody has a construct i have we have singularly hedged on this issue this hedging has been a result of of our own perception of our power and influence till now we were a diffident power we did not think that we have the credible capacities capabilities in all domains in in terms of comprehensive national power which i think you talked about i can talk a lot about comprehensive national power but the fact of the matter is right we have not evolved a strategic road map where is it that we want to go i'll give you an example at least in our writing and which we sometime have the pleasure of uh, of of sharing with the government and the senior people is the fact is that india is looking at united states as a internal balancer what do we need by internal balancing what we need by internal balancing is ensuring capacity capability systems integration regional uh, maritime domain awareness and all those elements of power that goes through to cover the period of strategic vulnerability which was till 2030 but i'm sadly speaking it is now getting extended to 2035 we are in a period of strategic vulnerability 
Now, how do we handle this period of strategic vulnerability? It requires a clear cut policy thinking, strategic thinking. We need to do a net assessment on that. How is it? What are the elements? What are the drivers that will drive us? See, until unless we have a clarity in our mind. And at the political and the, and and at the at the at the conceptual national security level, as to which direction we want to head for in the next ten to fifteen years, then the systems will fall into place. Whether you want a nuclear submarine, you want an aircraft carrier, we want to, you want to become a part and parcel of this grouping, that grouping. Now what is happening is everybody comes up every day with a new grouping and we say, okay, like he rightly said, we just go follow Birchal and follow that grouping. What are the what what is it there in in uh, in, in these grouping that we need to so, second thing issue is we also have to understand one aspect. Our competitors stroke challengers are not on the same page. They are all very, very. Uh, they, they, they. Uh, no, they, they look at very, very deeply on their perspective of the world and how they want to shape the world. Where do they want to be? They may be right. They may not be right. But they have a blueprint. They have an understanding. They have an idea. And therefore, on your show, I want to humbly urge everybody who is listening, particularly from the establishment that we need to create a strategic vision for India. And until unless we create that strategic vision in India, we will be buying all kinds of equipment, we will be getting into a lot kind of economic packs, but we, there is no understanding as to where what is what they, that is leading to. That That's my short answer to your question, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. And don't sir me. I, we are all colleagues uh, trying to resolve the same issue. That's, a, that's a colloquial language, sir. We always do. <laughs> Thank you. That's, no, that's for, the point which I'm trying to make is also, sir, I also don't like because sir is also known as popular acronym is servant I remain. You know, things like that has been talked about as a British legacy. So I always say, naam bahut acha hai. let's talk about a name. Brigadier Saab, the baat kahi hai, Adityan ji. I want to jump on that part of it, that India lacks, uh, you know, vision for itself. And that's the reason most of the time India is always reacting instead of creating a platform or responding. There's a lot of difference between reaction and response. <clears throat> so coming to that element, coming to that element, let's talk about the economic imperative, climate change. It's a US president keeps talking about this is the greatest global threat and security threat. Is it? Is it? Because that's important. Are we addressing the core issue of climate change? Because that will also define the world order. The core issue of climate change, I was on a platform with the economist uh, a couple of years ago, and they were talking about world population increasing from 3 billion to 2 billion to 8 billion and heading towards 12. Right? It's a simple paradigm. We are consuming so much of world resources today. We are not addressing that challenge. We are just become a consuming world. Because if by God's by, by God's decree, say for example, if the world population was to go, to go down by half, I think climate change problem will disappear itself. Your thought on that? Okay, before I address that particular challenge, I will uh, add uh, you know, some comments about what Brigadier Dr. Segal said. The culture of strategic diffidence in India. Right. And that is something that is slowly changing. It is not there. We are not there yet. And I'll give you some examples. Uh, there were actually flashes of lights when India did show some firm determination creating Bangladesh on the eastern flank, merging Sikkim into the Indian Union. So there have been times, but it is true that we do not have a national strategic 
vision document or national strategic plan. Having said that, you know, if we had one, even the climate change challenges will come into that because once you have a national strategic and security doctrine, it's not just about military issues, it's about economic security, population control, it involves everything. And yes, there has been, you know, a culture of status quo, but that is changing. So besides dealing with climate change, which is, you know, not under the control of one country, I think India needs to focus more on internal reform. Again, manufacturing, population control, changing the obsolete laws that do not help us to grow the way we need to grow, changing our judicial system, which is almost a laughing stock with number of pendencies. So we have a lot of legacy issues that we need to work on. And if we don't work on those, we will always be hampered. So let me give an uh, analogy. If I'm a neonatologist and I'm dealing with a baby who was born preterm, I use the concept of catch-up growth. India has to do catch-up mm. growth in a number of spheres with firm determination so that the perceived disadvantages in various spheres including actually, you know, climate challenge and all that sort of thing is taken care of. So we really need to work on issues like creating a national military industrial complex. There's nothing wrong with it. You know, you export arms. We have started to export some arms. We are generating some cash. Why should we remain behind that? We have capabilities, uh, but we need to build up capacity more. Similarly, in manufacturing, we are doing miserably. We have to do that. We have to introduce population control because otherwise, whatever progress we do, it will be stymied because you know you have more population to feed. Climate challenge is something India can take lead, but India cannot you know dictate to other countries. You know, uh, banning single-use plastics is a very good thing. We need to have some sort of, you know, framework for regulating chemicals, you know. At this point in time, if you see in last 30 years, suddenly from not having any cancer cases, India has turned very high on, you know, cancer incidence rates, new cancer incidence rates. Why? Because we do not have regulatory structures. You know, the chemical effluents are going into water. There's no potable water, things like that. So, yes, from a global perspective, climate change is an issue, but India cannot work alone. There's a legacy from Western world who exploited the environment, used the third world countries to do their dirty work. That will require more of multilateral work. But India's challenge is domestic and internal. We can, you know, strategic diffidence, you know, China tested its ASAT kinetic weapons in 2011. And I wrote about it and I spoke to then National Security Advisor in a public forum and he didn't want to address that, Shiv Shankar Mena. Luckily, later on, we did our own testing. Why it is that that we put roadblocks and self goals for ourselves by artificially putting limits where we have capability, we have intellectual capability, but we refuse to build actually strategic capacity. And that needs to change, whether it is in terms of, uh, you know, very dirty word, nuclear weapons. I would like India's policy maker to revisit the NFU doctrine, no first use doctrine. It does not serve any purpose. Okay, if you don't want to have a first use doctrine, at least transform and metamorphose into the sole purpose doctrine that there is a sole purpose of India's nuclear weapon that is, you know, guarding the security 
and strategic integrity of India instead of letting your adversaries do the first strike. So we have to develop a strategic spine. Our diffidence is changing in certain areas, but there is the, not a full-blown metamorphosis into a confident, modern, progressive thinking nation that zealously guards its own so sovereignty. That is where the challenges lie. That's so well said. I totally subscribe to your thought, Aditya, that any change that we want to ha see happen, it has to begin from you first. And uh, the strategic diffidence and, you know, couching the inability to do something behind certain glorious words is a sign of not being smart enough. And what bothers me as, a, as someone who has talked a lot about India, been involved in many spheres, is the fact that we are worshippers of sun, right? We have known it didn't require a strategic insight or a military intelligence or a great thinking to figure out that we were totally dependent on other countries for our energy supplies, right? But we were abundant with sunlight. We have a naturally st natural strength of sunlight coming in, we never developed the technology. Surya Bhagawan ki puja karte rahe, lekin unse maanga kuch nahi. Unse aapke baat nahi liya. That's, that's my concern. That we have been, you know, we indulge ourselves in a strategic paralysis. The second element that comes to me, I lived in two cities in India, Pune and Bangalore. In, when I lived there, from in Pune from 69 to 75, and then to Bangalore, 78 to 83. These, this, this city, were, these two cities were so wonderful that you virtually ran fan for two or three times in a year. Today, the temperature shoot up 40 degrees. Now, is it climate change or is it economic imperatives of urbanization, excess population coming up, Earth's resources are being consumed? Are we addressing and that is becoming a challenge? So urbanization happens, people concentrate in Bangalore and Pune, industrialization. Other than the your mic system has an issue. Kindly mute it, please. Thank you. Thank you. So the point here is very important to bear in mind that are we diffident to the extent of hurting ourselves? And to that end, it is important for us to figure out that change happens. We need either an incremental change or a transformative change. Today in India, in my opinion, we need to have a strategic vision to bring about a transformative change. Tomorrow we will all be a day older. There is nothing new about it. That's a known. Tomorrow everything, everybody in the world will be a day older. The question is, how will, am I going to shape myself tomorrow? Arunji, your thoughts on it? Uh, you know, it's absolutely correct. I mean, I uh, I sometimes wonder as to why is it that we cannot institutionalize systems? I mean, we have everything. All our capacities are there. There's nothing wrong, nothing. I'll give you a small example. In my golf club, there is a guy who cleans up the uh, the shrubs. Now, there's a three-man team. The guy who's, who uses the machine, the guy at the back of him who just picks it up, and then the third is there's a tractor which takes it all away and pushes it. But I, you see, any construction activity, there's a guy who's doing his job, he simply does his job, he digs the road, he leaves the city, and then he walks away. He simply is not constructed. There is no element following behind him. There no, it's not a total systems approach. We are simply not having a total system. We are doing a lot of dikhawa. That's the sad part. We are spending a huge amount of money, huge amount of resources. We have the capacity, like this, right? We have immense capacities. But the point at issue is, is they are not being systematized, they have not been integrated, and we do not have an understanding how to create an, an, an work culture atmosphere. 
that is sadly missing you're right it is being brought into play a lot of good things are happening a lot of lot of smart systems are being there digitization i tell you something there is nobody else better than in digitization than anybody else i mean no indian can escape the income tax system here because everything that it does is is picked up and, and is recorded i mean it's amazing it's amazing absolutely we have done some incredible work right please the way we handled covid it was not a easy thing to do but we have handled it. but again these are episodic incidents that's right. they are episodic what happens after that what happens after that have we created them into a thing no we are doing things for show we do a payment we're doing it for a show we are doing anything that we do it is for show i mean you make my i take the idea of doing a phenomenal amount of work but too much of this thing is to go and crow about little little uh, you know uh, successes they are important for the of the scientists i agree with them but the point is you send a message this is a globalized world whatever you do is picked up from the other side other side looks at you from a very different perspective so what again i will urge is that we need to and for younger generation i'm 75 i just turned 75 about four days back happy but, birthday Happy <laughs> thank you but uh, i'm simply trying to say that we are younger generation my country has everything but it has the problem of putting the whole thing in together we do not have systems of systems approach i mean that's that's my short answer to your question well, thank we you so much i mean it is there are there are times when if you want to change you need to do changes about you alone yeah. it begins from here so if we had, we can talk about change all day long but if we don't do something about it then it is failing and falling yeah. Yeah. aditin ji i will come to you with another thought process of mine here is that you know we will i want to have both of you speak about the accusation that i have seen in the american tv and media that india is collaborator of russia and india is buying oil from russia and it is enriching russia kind of thing everybody knows everybody knows that even from the sanctions on russia the gas and oil is not part of the sanction right europeans are buying it germany is buying it so i have said this in the forum here in couple of places that you know it is a clear demand and supply and market situation and my own self need india's own self need so if the oil is available from Turkey from russia as a cheaper price i'm buying it why must not india look at its interests from the indian perspective just as we in america say that we do things for america for american people and america's future generation right why must not india boldly say so that we are doing it for our economic need for our people or our innovation why that thing is not heard Jashankar ji has been making some very powerful bold statements and he is living up to his reputation when he said once upon a time that you will see aggressive foreign policy posturing by India and he demonstrated i am asking you why is it that we are const- constantly on the back foot uh devuti yeah. ji thanks for that question before i answer that questions i will just take from what Brigadier Segal had said about you know this lack of vision and consistency and clarity. Uh, I know Vibhuti ji, you are from Bihar, and I am going to make a statement. It's a provocative statement. Okay, go ahead. What we need in India is a total revolution of our psyche, our vision, our thinking, our attitude, and our system. Total revolution. i am using those words those two words which were used by a very famous bihari but that is what we need a total intellectual revolution that also includes you know we talk about economy we talk about manufacturing we talk about defense sector india needs to actually judicial reforms significant judicial reforms you know the government comes out with a scheme agnipat and people are running to the supreme court next time 
you challenge, uh, you know, an adversary, and Supreme Court is going to dis define what kind of, you know, military response we are going to calibrate. I think things have gone to the level of ridiculousness. So we do need a total revolution and total reformation of the system. And there are no holy cows that should be left, including the judiciary, because judiciary is becoming a drag on the economic and you know strategic growth of India. So that is what I wanted to say about that. About your next question, India needs to develop a strategic spine. India, I have already said that, you know, you can work with any of the groupings. You are the final balancer. At this point in time, you are the balancer. You are a net security provider in the Indo-Pacific region. You need an organization called IORA, Indian Ocean Rim Association. You took the leadership in International Solar Association. So there is no reason why India should be a diffident camp follower of United States. That's not going to happen. I will admit that there were some inconsistencies. The United States put sanctions on Iran and pressurized India to buy, stop buying oil from Iran. Who benefited? China. China got concessional oil from Iran. We have ties with Iran that go beyond, you know, the contemporary world. And we do need Iran in our orbit to balance Pakistan. So there was no reason to actually uh, listen to United States by stopping the, you know, import of oil from Iran. Now, once bitten, twice shy. I think India learned the lesson. And in case of sanctions, unilateral sanctions, I would say, on Russia, India is not heading to United States, quote unquote, dictates. India has to guard its own economic interests, and it is in India's economic interest that we purchase hydrocarbon resources from wherever in the entire world based on our economic interests. We cannot buy shale oil and, you know, uh, the oil that United States sells with higher cost, higher transportation costs by replacing Russia. There's no reason for it, and we need to be upfront about it, just like we have been upfront about uh, buying an initial, uh, you know, missile defense system, the S-400 from Russia, and we didn't buckle down. Similarly, in our strategic purchases of hydrocarbon resources, we need to have an independent policy. There's no need to listen to uh, any X, Y, or Z country. There are no universally accepted sanctions on Russia. These are unilateral sanctions, and unilateral sanctions never succeed. Thank you very much. I mean, we have remaining five minutes and six minutes of time. I wanted to address one two issues. One of them is, uh, is uh, you referred to about the Katsa sanction, which we talked about uh, a year and a half ago almost. We analyzed yes. clause by clause, and we came to the conclusion that United States will not impose sanction on India and Katsa related specifically for all the good reasons we talked about, you know, in your show, Adityanji. And we said that uh, uh, India qualifies for all the exceptions and the strategic need of America. India does not, India, US will never impose sanction. The question arises is, what do you think about uh, Ro Khanna passing a special legislation on that? And the second one, and that's a very important issue, is the fact that uh, how come we are not able to manage our neighbor's relationship? That really, irritates me a lot. Here is a country called Iran, uh, Israel, that is managing and living with boldly with all the in, in, enemy nations around it. Whereas we, as a huge country of 1.3 billion people, are not able to handle, at least that's a public person, that's what the image we get of issues in Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Nepal, and Pakistan, 
what is it about us? Which kind of diffidence? What kind of a behavioral thing that happens that we are unable to handle our neighbors in the manner that they are not a constant pinprick in India's relationships? Arunji, you go first on this. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, we have uh, on our Western front, Pakistan and Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan has been a source of a pain in the neck for to us for the last, last 75 years. We have fought a number of wars, etc. But the reality of today is basically this. As far as India is concerned, Pakistan does not matter. It's, a, it's more of a construct in the minds of people who live in the past. Uh, I am being part of uh, three dialogues, political dialogue, nuclear dialogue, and mill to mill dialogue with Pakistanis for the last 12 years. And I can tell you one thing. The fundamental point we tell them is, by Pakistan, ke saath, kuch lena dena nahi hai. the younger generation in India says, what's in it for India? in building up relationship with Pakistan. Correct. We have to, we are, we are following what is called a containment strategy, you know, as a vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan concerned. But yet the reality is the world, major powers, has a huge sense of romanticism with Pakistan. United States have pumped in billions of dollars as using Pakistan as a proxy for a war in Afghanistan. The China is using Pakistan as a leverage for entering into the Western Indian Ocean and Arabian Sea as also as a, as, a, as, a, as a providing a collusive challenge to India. These are the realities of life. And this is something which we have to live with. Do they bother us? Yes. They impose costs on us. Those costs are heavy. How do we, how do we settle them? I'll give you a small answer, small example. Pakistan asked for $6 billion of IMF bailout loan. And how much does the IMF give them? $7 billion. <laughs> Why? Poor, poor Sri Lanka is asking for $1.5 billion. They get zilch. Pakistan continues to use its leverage as a nuisance player, which is, which is, nuclear power or nuclearly armed and they continue to do this the sad part is the the western world is so terrified of terrorism and the growth of terrorism that they're willing to overlook this a similar logic applies to a limited degree even with the chinese of the of the islamic uh, union islamic military union of uzbekistan IMU and other Arabs who, are, who, who can create trouble for them in, in uh, Xinjiang. The, the problem for us basically is this, is that we were tr too trusting of Pakistan. We did not realize their true intent. And we had an opportunity in 71. I was just now in the last dialogue, I told them. I said, we let go your 96,000 uh, prisoners. We wanted peace. You still continue to needle us. No more. India will not accept that. So India is following what I call a strategy of denial. Pakistan will be denied all opp opportunity of needling us beyond a point. And should they needle us, there will be retribution. I'm saying a lot, but I, 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 I want to be counted on that. There will be severe retributions. As far as other neighbors are concerned, they are slowly realizing they are freedom. And India is not an assertive part. Please understand that. We just we 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 all understand that. We like to have a, a, a good relationship with our neighbors. We don't want to assert, we don't want to interfere in their internal affairs. Therefore, as Nepal is concerned, Nepal is realizing how how they are being manipulated. I'll give you a small example. They signed an agreement. Uh, five years back, which they kept hiding from the uh, public with the Chinese. Similarly, the, the Sri Lankans are realizing. So the issue basically is this thing is, we are, we 
because of our very nature are not an aggressive and assertive power we will we like like there was a, uh, the meaning of sagar is security and growth for the region we want have to take all our neighbors together and i for between you and me i can tell you that within pakistan also there is a realization that is emerging particularly among the younger people is what has this this enmity with india got us we are forever in trouble we are a country where there is there is political troubles there is there is a country there is where there is a rising terrorism the the ttp has its bases in afghanistan territory killing 30 to 40 servicemen from the pakistani military forces every month they cannot control ttp and then they have a economic crisis so what is it that they have gained so i think the policy of maintaining a strong credible posture vis-a-vis -vis pakistan and yet keeping the door open for negotiations on terms that we are comfortable with is the only policy vis-a-vis -vis pakistan thank you so much that was such a that was such an amazing practical solution to the to dealing with the enemy neighbors around to, to you, the last question of the day, and please take two minutes to ask me that. One thing that you talk about, I think, I don't want to my microphone. I can hear you. I can hear you. Probably you need to close down one of your mics. You have two open, it appears. Think about it. Yeah, anyway. The question I will say, please take two minutes to respond and then we will end the day today's conversation is, we live in America. We are professionals. We have done well. Uh, Americans love us as Im immigrants because of all the good reasons, including that we are not a law and order problem anywhere in the as the immigrant community. Why is it that the Indian community in the United States lacks the clout to carry the message forward of India and Indianness and all the good things that Indians are, what is it as a geopolitical requirement for us that are we just going to be sitting here making money, making a good life, and you know just you know and go back into sunset, or are we going to count in the communities that we live in? And if it, if we have to count, what must happen? Two minutes. This is a topic I want to have a longer conversation on this matter. So, Vibhuti ji, our upbringing and our culture is such that we abhor any kind of strong responses, whether that is for Indians in India in terms of geopolitics or Indian diaspora. You know, in every country where Indian diaspora is there, you yeah. find they are at the receiving end. And the reason is that we try to use our intellect, but we don't use our the muscle power uh, or the strength, whether it is political strength, so whether it is, you know, Uganda of Idi Amin, whether South Africa even now, whether it is Guyana, whether it is other West Indian countries, Fiji Island, Indian diaspora has been at receiving end. And that's a pattern. And the same pattern you are seeing in the United States when you say that we don't have political club. So we really have to be part of the power process, understand what our interests are. Things are changing now, of course. In UK, things are changing. You have Rishi Sunak, you know, vying for the prime ministership. It is a different issue that he will probably not get because of the identity politics of white racism. But at least you see a good role model there. And I think this is what Indian Americans and Hindu Americans have to do. If you are here, you are part of the political structure. You have to actually contest local elections, school board elections, state assembly elections, whatever, 
at any and every level and not just be complacent with earning money and getting laurels and just not be satisfied with getting photo op opportunities with prominent politicians while you are donating them to their PACs. And the analogous example is what India is doing in the neighborhood that you have a checkbook which is open to Sri Lanka, to Maldives, to Afghanistan, to Bangladesh, to Nepal. We don't put conditionalities. We need to be much more transactional and it has to do with national character. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And there is a question that has come about, and I, I want to ask to both of you, give a short one minute answer, and then we will end the show today. Uh, Boss Baby is asking, do you think new chain of events at low pace is shaping the new world order and the old order is gone? Arunji? I agree with him. You agree with him? Yeah. All right. Aditya Absolutely. Ji, yeah, it's slow boil. Yeah. Uh, as I said, history never ceases. The changes are not instantaneous. Changes are not, you know, uh, cataclysmic. It takes time, but world will not remain frozen into 19 post 1945 geopolitical world order. That is changing. Newer powers are emerging, and you are seeing a slow change. And from Indian perspective. Indian attitude is changing. India's strategic posture is changing in the good direction. Yes, it is. Which it was much more stronger, much more, you know, faster. Yeah. But we are seeing change that is going to come. Thank you. And I thank you very much for being a part of such a wonderful conversation. Arunji, you came on Jaipur Dialogue for the first time, and I am delighted to have you. Happy birthday, sir. And uh, Dr. Saab, and one thing which I wanted to mention. Thank you very much, sir. 75, you are not old, sir. Biden is the president of the United States at 80. Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer. Yeah, and no, 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 no. <laughs> so there is a lot to bat for India as of now. And India would depend upon Dr. Absolutely. Brigadier Sagal's expertise and knowledge to reshape things. And I, it was very heartening Thank to hear from you that there will be strong reprisals against Pakistan and they know it. I'm so glad to hear that if that is my, that's my takeaway today and aditinji i totally endorse and agree with you that change must come and it must come from within thank you very much for being part of this just one last word please india's strategic community needs to give up the romantic delusion that strong and stable pakistan is an interest <laughs> we just abuse ourselves in the notion Thank you very much. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely great. Thank you. We have to get out of our romantic delusions, as the saying goes. So thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, you know, technology is with us. Today we are connected from Delhi, New York, and Adityanji's place in eastern other side of the America. And I mean, so various parts of America. We are on the same time having a live conversation. This is important for all Indians to know that. And I have said this before that India is on the cusp of technological revolution. We must embrace it wholeheartedly. That's what will bring about a transformative shift that we are looking for. This is not the time for incrementalism in India. It's a time for a wholesale change. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Good, good night, and very glad to you Thank you. with us today. Thank you. Have a nice day, folks. Yes, sir. Thank you. Good night.